Guides in the Gulf. Stopwatch, start. Yep, out of shot. Perfect. Perfect. I'm going to go to the pub after this, mate, or not? <laughs> Try and stop me. Yeah, well, if, if we go around an hour, then uh, it'll just be the start of happy hour. Oh, perfect. <laughs> perfect. And then oh. uh, get organised from there for fishing tomorrow. Yeah. We should get, actually, we should hook that boat up to your Toyota. Okay, yeah, and I'll take it back to mine. And then, um, yeah, we'll get that sorted, actually. Right. We'll jump back. Yeah, Roger. G'day guys, welcome to another episode of uh, Guys in the Golf Podcast. You're here with uh, Ash Garner and Mikey mm -hmm. Cunningham. There you go. <laughs> Sorry mate, cut you off there. Yeah, all good. Uh, yeah, so um, anyway, so we're episode uh, five now, I reckon. Yeah. So we're uh, flying along fairly well, mate. Hopefully people are enjoying it. Thanks yeah. everyone that's uh, liked and subscribed and uh, downloaded the podcast and had a listen. Yeah, I think um, we're enjoying it, so, so we'll keep making it. Yeah, man, we're only drinking zero beers still, so we're not even drinking yeah, proper beers well, yet. <laughs> wait, till, wait till February. <laughs> <laughs> yeah, so uh, that will be really, really enjoying it. So uh, that'll be good. We'll get some people on soon and um, and that as well uh, in the new year, uh, if it's not the new year already when you're listening to this. Yeah, no, we've got, we've got all our days screwed up, so yeah, it'll be somewhere around Christmas time, I reckon. Yeah. So um, it won't be far off though, we'll, we'll definitely have uh, some guests on and talk about some interesting stuff and yeah, get amongst it. So. Um, yeah, we wanted to start today by telling you a little bit more about King Ash Bay, which is where you call home. Yeah, it's where yep. we are right now. Well, I mean, you call it home as well. I suppose much. I do. I used to live here <laughs> with my wife, and then uh, then we had kids, and we moved to Darwin. And um, but yeah, it's but now I spend oh, half my time here. I yeah spend time with my wife and kids up in Darwin. I come down here to make videos. <laughs> yeah, and that's it. And I, I live here full time, um, yeah. and have done for several years now. Um, a uh, couple of businesses here between the King Ash Bay Lodge and um, and commercial mud crab fishing, um, high boats and all sorts of stuff. So, and president of the fishing club as well um, now. So, Il Presidente. Yeah, yeah. I think this is my th maybe third third year now. Yeah. Um, I spent plenty of years on the on and off the committee and doing different things. Um, so, um, basically, how King Ash Bay works is we've got a, a management team um, which is voluntary that sort of manages the day-to-day -day operating o operations of the actual business. So um, obviously we are a fishing club, a not-for-profit organisation, but um, we obviously have to run like a business as well to main make sure that we're making enough money to pay staff and insurances and things like that. So although we don't aim to um, bank keep some money, we obviously have to um, you know, get, keep cash and reserves for emergencies and things. I think we might have touched on in our episode one yeah. uh, about how King Ash Bay sort of works. But well, when you, you said know, management team for you guys at home, uh, so it's just like your local footy team, uh, footy club. Sorry, like you've got your your president, your secretary, uh, your treasurer, all that kind of stuff. So yeah, it's literally just like any other club, except here. <clears throat> pardon me. Except here, Ash is more like the mayor of the town rather than the, the president of the club, you know what I mean? Yeah, and, and that's why I say, like, we, you know, our, our management team, you know, we're a committee, um, the King Ashford Fishing Club Management Committee, but um, uh, I say management team because, yeah, we are more like a council than just a small sporting club sort of thing because we do things like, you know, we're our own garbage collection, power, you know, power generation, power, power water uh, reticulation, all that sort of stuff um, is done in house. So we're not funded by the government or anyone else. We don't have any council, um, that, you know, yeah. that the council doesn't really do anything for us directly in, in King Ash Bay itself. Yeah, even um, all our internal roads, like we maintain all our own roads and build our own roads, yep. power poles, power lines. Yeah, everything. Yeah. So basically, if you've got a place here and you, you pay a power bill, um, you, you're paying it to the fishing club. You're not paying it to, you know, a big energy company yeah. like Origin or something like that. You're paying it directly to the club. So, um, and then, you know, uh, that way we try and keep our costs down as much as possible. Obviously, it's not cheap um, uh, running a place of this, this size, you know. Um, we go through... You know, a few hundred thousand litres of diesel a year, and you know, obviously, uh, power generation is fairly expensive maintaining that equipment and stuff there. But over the years, it's been, um, you know, improved and improved on. So, so now we've got, you know, automatic call up generators and things like that. We've got solar bores now for our water. So, so we're, we're pretty much a self sufficient town. So, um, so yeah, so that's sort of how King Ash Bay sort of works. We've got, you know, some permanent residents that live here all year round, others that live here for 
uh, most of the dry season and then go away for the wet season, which is we're just coming into the wet season now. Um, so wet season sort of from the end of October through till um, around the end of March, uh, more or less, is our wet season and that's when we're sort of uh, quietest here. Um, most people sort of go away then, but, um, but although, yeah. Although we, even though we're quiet, like right now it's early December and mm. we've, um, campers still arriving we're, as we drove here just yeah. now. <laughs> there's campers arriving in the caravan park yeah, still in early December. Yeah, so the club's still open, um, so for camping and things like that. So our unpowered sites, for anyone that's been here before, would know Jenny Flat, so which is the unpowered sites that um, run along the banks of the MacArthur River. Um, there's plenty of amenities and stuff down there. Brand new barbecue area, camp kitchen um, uh, we just put in this year. Um, that's closed for the wet season. That's closed until uh, the 1st of April, uh, most likely. Um, but we're still there's usually a lineup of uh, people waiting, waiting to get in there. Yeah, up, up paying for power, and they want to go down and spend less money down. And if they, if you uh, can do that, like yeah. if you've got a, a, a rig set up for being off grid, then why not? Yeah, and that's yeah, that's why it's called Jenny Flats. It's a generator flats. Yeah, so yeah, pe yeah. people can run Jennies there during the daytime to charge their batteries and maintain their stuff. So if you're planning a trip here, it's a, not a bad not a bad place to camp. They're right on right on the river. So um, yeah, top spot to. Top spot to go and camp down there, but yeah, we've still got people in the powered area now. Um, yeah, so, um, oh, and at a couple of episodes, maybe our last episode of the episode before we talked about, um, we are going to go help pull the shade sails down, mate. We, we didn't end up doing that, guys. I'm very sorry. So. Well, the shade sails came down. They did, they did come down, but we, we didn't do it. The boys started uh, a bit earlier than we expected, so. <laughs> yeah. So, so um, we're going to talk about um, the, the greater impacts on the community and and the economy that we that we are here at Cash Bay. Yeah, so, well, I mean, we've got, you know, just under a thousand uh, financial members. And when I say financial members, it's not like uh, other sporting clubs or, you know, potentially RSL, some things like that, where you can become a member for five bucks or 10 bucks to become a member, a financial member of the club. Um, there is a small process. I mean, we're not trying to be exclusive or anything like that, but um, you know, we, we do want to um, in, ensure that people are making a good commitment to the place. So um, I noticed even on the form the, where you sign up to become a member, there's a category for like, what's your skills or trades? Like, what can you offer the club? Yeah. You know, and some people might be an accountant or a bricklayer or a, an electrician, you know, they might be semi-retired or retired and they can offer their their knowledge and help around the club. Yeah, so we try and keep a bit of a database or a bit of an idea of who who's who um, so that when people are here and if, if there is an issue and we don't have somebody um, you know, available to deal with it straight away, we can we can have a look at that and, and uh, find somebody who may be skilled in that particular area that we can uh, call upon to do things for the club um, on a voluntary basis. And, um, you know, like, like, you know, we have, you know, once a month we have um, volunteer drinks. So anyone that's been helping out for that previous month can come down and have a few beers on the club for, uh, for helping out around the place. So yeah, which, it's always which, good fun. Yeah, quite often happens as well. So, um, you know, retired Sparky or something like that, we might have a, a small issue that needs to be looked at that they can come and give advice on or something like that. And, you know, we'll call upon people like that. Um, but yeah, so in terms of um, um, the impact on the sort of broader community, like, you know, we are a big place here now. Like we've got, um, you know, like I said, nearly a thousand members, just under a thousand members. Uh, we have, you know, several, you know, well, hundreds of thousands of bed nights, um, stays per year in terms of tourists that are coming through from interstate and down south. Uh, that maybe they're travelling across the Savannah Way from Cairns to Broome and, and stop in here for a few days and things. So, you know, all those people that uh, that come to King Ash Bay, they've got to stop in in uh, Boralula and you know Mataranka and Catherine Daly Waters, Barkley Homestead, you know Hell's Gate, all those places. So, you know, it's um, you know the amount of people that come here it does have an impact on on not just us but all of those other service providers along the way, all the service stations and supermarkets and and all that sort of stuff and. You know, I think we're a fairly big contributor to, um, yeah, to the to the territory econ economy in that way. I mean, yeah, massive. It's just come out that I think um, the recreational fishing in the Northern Territory brings in about two hundred and seventy million dollars per annum uh, to the territory economy, and King Ash Bay certainly helping with that quite significantly. I reckon. Uh, and and 
you know, considering our impact on um, uh, on the Territory Government's coffers, you know, the taxpayers' coffers of the Northern Territory. Um, you know, we get very, well, we ask very little of the, the government for support and things like that. So um, obviously the, the Territory Government maintains the boat ramp and the road into King Ash Bay and river markers and things like that in the river. But um, in terms of actually around King Ash Bay itself, we pretty much do everything ourselves. Yeah. So, so yeah. Yeah, so um, some of the different fishing here, mate, yeah, uh, that people fishing. can expect. Yeah. So, yeah, I mean, it depends what time of year you come, but, um, you know, we've got everything from uh, barra fishing to blue water fishing, so uh, all of your estuary species, um, you know, uh, what have we got, mate? Mangrove jacks, barras. Oh, yeah, well, the the, the pinnacle one is, is barra. People come here to catch barra. Mo- yeah, that mostly. is the main thing, yeah. Yeah, but like any estuary, any estuary fish, you, know, you get everything from... From cod to threadfin salmon to um, oh, queenies, uh, yeah, grounder. And oh, there's there's miles of them out there. Few flathead every now. And yeah, yeah, we got few flathead. The other yeah, day. Yeah, brim and flathead. Yeah. So yeah, pretty much everything that you get in most estuaries around sort of tropical, subtropical Australia, yeah. you'd get here. Yeah. And then um, then obviously we have the blue water fishing as well, which is which is unreal here. It really is, and and that's a, I think that's a, a, an untapped thing there as well uh, out around the island we've spoken about it a couple of times already but you know it's uh, just such a beautiful area um you know it's especially on a good day if you get out there and it's uh, you know you get a glass off out there it's it's worth a million bucks mate it's uh, it's really fantastic and you can get so many different sorts of um, reef fish out there from you know we've well this year we've had a few uh, marlins caught this year yeah, we've had right, some yeah. sailfish yep. caught um you know so um, you know, if you're from down south and you're planning a trip or something up here and you're not really sure, you know, if you chase marl or something down south, you can bring your marlin gear and you get a good day, you can get out the front and you can go and chase marlin and sailfish and Spanish mackerel, long-tailed tuna. Yeah, all the pelagics, yeah, the tunas, the, the huge GTs, uh, yeah, any of those pelagics. But then, yeah, you pull up and do a bit of bottom bouncing and then you've got your... Uh, um, cold trout, your red emperor, your nana guy, mm-hmm. golden snapper, big mangrove jacks out oh, on the yeah. reefs, real big mangrove yeah, jacks. Yeah, the further out, the further out you want to go, and, yeah. and all sorts of light sport fishing as well. So like trevallies and queenfish. Yeah. Um, uh, Even the tuna on on light gear is is great fun. Yeah, well that's it. That's a, that's a gr- always great uh, great fun to do that, especially if somebody that hasn't um, hasn't been out there and experienced that before. And you get across those, you know, we get, come across bait balls and things. Yeah. Where like the birds are working yeah. and, and you've got like a football field size of bait there and just getting absolutely annihilated by everything from mackies to queenies to trevallies to tuna, um, you know, all that sort of stuff, barracudas and and that um, and then you know if, if you're real keen. Um, you know, you get painted craze and stuff out around the islands as well in the shallow reefs. Yep. Um, I mean, you wouldn't catch me doing too much snorkeling these days, but um, uh-huh. I've done it. I've done it before. People do it, uh, yeah. And I know know a few guys that still do it and uh, and always get a big feed of craze. So um, yeah, plenty of painted craze and stuff here as well. Yeah. And Not, then obviously mud crabs. Yeah. <laughs> what do you know about mud crabs? <laughs> <laughs> yeah. So. Um, yeah, working as a commercial uh, mud crab fisherman. Yeah, there's obviously plenty of mud crabs here, so um, and they're not very easy to catch, especially if you've got kids or something like that. It's great to chuck a few crab pots in because even if you go out for a day and you're not doing too good on the fish, you can. Um, you should get a crab or two, yeah. Yeah, yeah. Well, especially the, the last few years, the crab yeah. the crabs have been really, really good. So. Um, yeah, to give people an idea of um, of all the from from Barra all the way through to Blue Water. So from our boat ramp here, most people head down towards the mouth. Yep. If, even if you're fishing for barramundi, mm-hmm. most people head straight down towards the mouth and all the different feeder creeks and stuff uh, off off the main MacArthur River and its and its yep. other creeks. So we're talking what 40 k's to the mouth. Yeah. So basically, if you go down the MacArthur or the Crooked, it's a, it's about 40 kilometres to the yeah. to the mouth from the boat ramp here, and it's about the same almost to get from here up to Borodula. So you can go oh, up, you went upstream. If you go upstream, yeah. So King Ash Bay is about halfway um, between Borodula and the mouth of the river. Yeah. Um, and you can go upstream as well, and it's it's not bad. And, um, you know, both in the dry season, you can go up there and, and uh, fish in the deep water around the snags and stuff. And I mean, I, I spent a lot of time in Borodula, lived in Borodula, and used to fish in that section of the river between Borodula and King Ash Bay. Uh, quite extensively as a kid, so um, you know, with my first tinny I bought, used to fish in there a lot, and I always used to get some good barrows up in there. So um, there's there's miles of fish, and you get good jacks up there in, as well yeah, in that okay. sort of um, 
uh, you sort of uh, brackish water, so it's not 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 100 fresh, but it's not 100 salt either. Yeah, and once this, once you get up there, it ter- it, it's less mangroves and more of the the paper bark trees. It, yeah. it, it feels like you're in fresh water. Yeah, yeah in fact, that, it's yeah. good for a change every now and then to to go up and fish places like that. Yeah, actually, we should do that in the next couple of days before you take off, mate. We should go for a look up there. Yeah, Roger, yeah, do something. Mm-hmm. Anyway, yeah, so, um, yeah, there's excellent country up there. Um, even, like, if you've been here plenty of times and you've never been upstream, you should go and check it out. You do have to be careful. There are rock bars there, and, yeah. and a lot of them haven't been marked. In actual fact, I don't think any of them have been marked. I've never um, seen them marked. I've been lately. up there a couple of times. So, um, yeah, but, um, yeah. A few, there... a few years back, um, there was a, a couple here that put uh, maybe three years in a row, I reckon they did it. They organised like a convoy of anyone that's never been to Boral or in your boat before. Yeah. Come with us, we'll lead the way and, and get yourself a track in your sounder. Yeah. And I reckon one year we had 50 boats, mm-hmm. I reckon, with it, that went up there and we ended up pulling up on at the boat ramp at Boralula and... Um, uh, yeah, got barbecues going and had a bit of a, a sausage sizzle on the bank there. <laughs> yeah, yeah, that was good fun. It's, it's definitely a nice trip. It's definitely a nice trip. It's a r- really good. Uh, it's a big river, um, plenty of deep water up there. But yeah. yeah, there are there are rock bars that do go most of the way across the river, and you do sort of need to know where you're going or take it very easy. Um, you know, ask somebody. You know, if you're here and you want to go and have a look, ask. You know, someone like myself. You know, um, get some advice before you tackle it. Yeah. Otherwise, you, you know, you can do it yourself. But just take it easy. Yeah. Um, and you've got to be careful because the tides, um, the tides are a bit different. You know, as you get further upstream, you get obviously the tides take a lot longer to go in there, and then it's not impacted by the tide as much as here either. So. Yeah so, so, yeah, so if we head back downstream again, if we go down, we've, we've done our barra fishing for the first three days of our trip or something. Yep. On the fourth day, we poke our nose out and, and you can see there's a glass off out there and we decide we want to go around the islands. So what, what, what's, what's our, what would we do? We'd just, just send the, it? The, well, there's, there's miles, like, again, it, it's sort of like the rivers, obviously the rivers are like a delta here um, with, you know, thousands of kilometres of creek you can try. But then, yeah, you get out the front and it's much the same. You've got all these islands there, um, you know, 70, 80 odd islands in the group or islands, islands in the group and, and uh, shallow reefs and things like that. There's so much country. Um, you, yeah, just look at your uh, things like Navionics and um, charts. Uh, you know, even Google Earth, and you can have a look at spots. Depends sort of what you what you like doing. You know, if you like, um, you know, like we mentioned just a minute ago, light sport fishing things like that. You can just slip straight out on a good day out to the top of the island, say out to the top of West Island or North Island, or yeah. you know, uh, they've all got rocky outcrops on every single island, pretty yeah. much. Like yeah. But you know, you can just go out there and just look for birds, and you, you, don't, you, know, you don't even need a sound. You just go out there and just look for birds yep. working, and then you know, um, you know, light spin gear um, with uh, you know silver slugs and that sort of thing. Yeah. Um, you can you can flick straight in there, and you can get all sorts of things from you know queenies, tuna, mackerel, trevallies, um, you know barracuda, you know all sorts of stuff there. Yeah. Um, if you prefer um, bottom fishing with bait or some like, especially if you've got like again kids or, or people that maybe aren't overly experienced with with that sort of fishing you can um yeah, you can do bottom bouncing and then again there's there's miles and miles of reef all around those islands yeah. i get messages on my youtube channel all the time people or private messages on facebook asking people asking me for spots to fish at like gps marks yeah i mean it's, it's not that sort of area like <laughs> There's yeah, there's just so much out there. I can't say, oh, go here and you'll you, you'll get goldies. Yeah, different things work work at different times, obviously. Yeah. Um, you know, I obviously learned a fair bit there in my time um, as a, a fishing guide out around the islands. But, um, you know, you can go pretty much anywhere there on a good day and, um, you yeah. know... Just you, trust your sound, I reckon. Absolutely, just, yeah. just find something interesting on the bottom. And, and yeah, find find the structure and you'll, you'll find the fish. Um, that's, you know, as basic as it gets, you know... Um, uh, and if you're not doing any good like that, you can chuck some lures on and go for a troll. There's miles and miles of shallow reefs and ledges and stuff there, um, and you know, out around the islands, just just trolling along some of those rocky um, outcrops and foreshore and stuff. And you get things if you're trolling in close to the shallow water. You're getting real nice trout, jacks, um, you know, golden snapper, even uh, tusk fish, everything on lures there. So you know, I've done that plenty of times. Yeah. Or the other thing is, you know, you use, um, you know, soft vibes or all the rage or soft plastics, um, you know, you Z-Mans and gulps and um, 
all those types of things. You can flick them in amongst the rocks and, and get trout. And they, actually some of the best trout I've seen have been guys that have been really keen on the front of the boat when I've had a charter on a few guys, but they know what they're doing and bring, you know, bring their own gear as well. You know, they want to just chase trout. So you go out and you just pull up on, on some of those rocky headlands Cast and, into and the rocks. rock bombies and stuff and just flicking soft plastics in there, mate. And there's, there's so many fish here. It's just, it's almost untouched because you can, you can go out there for for days and hardly see another boat, you know. Yeah. Like, cause, and, and again, because it is such a big area, you know, once people get out there, everyone sort of goes their own way. And um, yeah, so there's yeah, so much country yeah. there. I think something that people would find surprising fishing out around the islands here, our reef fishing here, is compared to say the east coast, uh, the water here is really shallow. Yes. Like yeah. you firstly, you don't have to go very far out. And once you're out there, what the, the deepest water I've seen out there is well, no, 13 metres? Yeah, it's that's pretty pretty much it. So once you get out there near the channels, um, you know, you're sort of only a couple of metres deep out the mouths, and then um, uh, once you get out, really drops off to about 30 feet, you know, 10 metres or so, and that's pretty much it until yeah. you get right right out. I mean, there obviously there's, there's exceptions. There's some places where it... Um, where it does drop off and, and get deeper in uh, in some you know some of the, like center channel and things like that yeah um off observation island there's a couple of drop offs there, there that does get you know sort of 25 30 meters deep oh, yeah. but more more or less it's pretty much about 10 meters deep the whole way around and you do not need to be in deep water to catch good fish you yeah. know what I mean which is an excellent thing for baritrauma as well yeah which, yeah yeah so just really quickly i suppose baritrauma it's yeah Anyone that's done deep water fishing, if you pluck a water a, a fish from from deep water, it's the uh, air pressure down there is is very very dense. So you, any any air in it, they'll they'll puff up when they get to the low pressure. At, that yeah, once they get to um, sort of yeah, normal atm atmospheric yeah. pressure, um, and that at fish is going to die. Yeah, so and actually, there's been some great research done by um, fishers in the Northern Territory a few years ago. Um, and no, even the old Rex, he was on board. Rex Hunt was on board. Yeah. The adverse for it, um, you know, with his, you know, anyone that's seen Rex Hunt, I used to kiss, kiss the fish and throw them back. And, and um, but yeah, he did an actually advert series for the Territory government a few years back. Uh, where he said, you know, well, I used to do this, but now I've learned that that's not the best thing to do. So, and this is why in the territory we have um, uh, bag limits uh, more than size limits. So, yes, for things like um, at-risk species um, or controlled species like golden snapper, black jewfish, um, things like that, you need to be really careful because um, you, if you're pulling them up from 10 meters of water or more then they're almost certainly going to die in the research that's been done. Even if they look fine when you pull them up, even if their swim bladder isn't out of their mouth, um, which is a, that, that's the number one sign they've got barotrauma is they're, they're swollen, their swim bladder is actually hanging out their mouth. Um, but um, that's the number one sign. But even if you don't see that, they can still have barotrauma. And, and if you, like I say, anything more than 10 metres of water, it's nearly a guarantee that they're going to have barotrauma. Uh, and what happens is, they, um, they, their internal organs basically get crushed from the swim bladder on the inside. Yeah, it makes sense. And they'll die. It's, it's a near guarantee. Even if yeah. they don't float, even if they swim back down, uh, the research has shown quite clearly that, you know, yeah. they'll, they'll be predated fairly quickly by sharks and gropers and things like that yeah. in the area. And I saw how they did that research as well, like quite a few years back. Yeah, they literally would go fishing, catch the fish, and then put it in a put it in a cage and then yep. drop it down and put a camera in there yeah and to see see what the happens to the fish in the in the cage and yep. yeah and yeah and you watch them yeah just sort of yeah, yeah swim that, around sort of really dazed yeah. and then yeah you watch all the big shark come in and hit the cage trying to get to them yeah yeah and, and so, that's exactly what happens so so on, here being shallow water that, it's pretty good for that most places yeah, yeah. a lot of places you, you can catch a massive dewy yeah and and release it if you don't want to keep it yeah, yeah, which is good, and it's a, that's a good thing for sustainability, obviously. And you know, and sometimes you get out there. There's days you get out there and you get under the jewies. You might catch way more than your bag, but I mean, at the moment, I think it's only two per person for yeah. black jewfish. So you know, which is another good point as well is that you know, if you are if you are up here and you're um, uh, out fishing and you do come across a school of good fish. You know, make sure you're only keeping your bag limits. Make sure their size limits are right. As I said, most a lot of species don't have size limits, but um, but make sure you stick to your bag limits because if you don't, you will. You know, sooner or later you're going to get caught. And, yeah. You know, just because we're remote, it doesn't mean that fisheries don't come here. Yeah, they do. Mm. Yeah. With the uh, like Dewey's, I, I can remember you 
uh, I've been out a couple of times with you where we've been, we have been getting them and everyone's got Jewies on and we get them in and then you're like, whoa, 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 everyone stop, stop, like, you know, stop fishing. Mm-hmm. Like, you, you literally needed to count the Jewies. All right, well, this one's fine to release. Let's release that one. Let's release that one. Do you want to keep a fish? Yeah, all right. And you're working out, <laughs> like, look, yeah, just, just when they're on, they're on, you know? Yeah. Yeah. Yeah, absolutely. And the same with gold snapper as well, you know. Uh, they're the same, you know. When you get onto a school of those and, yeah. and you can get dozens and dozens. And with those, you can get them in, you know, a metre and a half of water. Some of the best yeah. goldie fishing I've done has been in very, very shallow water, only a couple of metres. So uh, literally, you, you you lift your rod up and you can see your, your hook, you know. So, um, and <clears throat> yeah, they, they absolutely love those rocky uh, outcrops and stuff. So there's miles of fishing for all, all different uh, people on all different occasions. You know, good days, you can get out around the islands. Um, but if you're coming here, particularly in the dry season, you, you might not want, want to go out there, it might be windy. So yeah. um, we touched on um, how um, high pressure systems in the bite um, down south affect our southeasterlies here. And when we get those big southeasterlies, you might not want to go outside because it might be blowing 15, 20 knots plus. Um, and you know, metre and a half, two metres of sea, uh, and it, uh, being fairly shallow, it chops up very quickly. So you can go from a glass off to being quite rough, you know, fairly quickly. And yeah. if you're in a smaller boat, especially, you've got to be really careful um, about uh, being out there in those conditions. Um, but you know, the, like we said, there's miles and miles of uh, creek. So if you're coming up, make sure you got, you know, your bait casters and things like that, so you can chase some barra. Um, you know, and and those other estuary species, you know, grunter and um, plenty of goldies in the rivers, cod. Yeah. Um, you know, there's there's plenty of other fish you can catch um, in the river as well. So yeah, even just outside the river, like not not quite around the islands, like we've you've, I've seen you catch Spanish mackerel. Yeah. Um, of well, only small, but I've caught little trout and red emperor. Yep. You know, sort of just outside the mounts. Yeah. Yep. So. So it just depends, um, you know, well, obviously what you want to do, but then, yeah, the weather as well can be um, impactful on on, uh, on your plans. So, you know, but there are plenty of different um, different things you can do. And I suppose, you know, if you are stuck fishing in the rivers or something like that, you want to be careful that you don't get stuck uh, in, you know, small creeks and things like that, because obviously when we've got big southeasterlies blowing, that can hold the tide out, um, you know, depending on the seasonal flows from wet seasons. Yeah, that's why they call it a you tide know. prediction. Yeah, not, <laughs> not, not, yeah, that's it. It is just a prediction, and, and the wind can definitely, in uh, in the Gulf here, it can hold the tide out, um, and it can slow it down from coming in as well, and it can make it drop out quicker. So if you fished an area previously and you know that, uh, you know, it might have been a few years ago, you know, oh, well, if I leave here two hours after high tide, I can still make it out. You've got to be really careful because that's not always the case. And there's been plenty of people who have been stuck yeah. um, you know, doing just that, you know, going off of previous, um, you know, expectations and, and coming unstuck. And I know we were talking about earlier with, um, you know, a couple of sandbars and the carries. And yeah, the- yeah. So uh, I, I follow, I've got, a, a sounder, or well, it's a new sounder, but I had uh, imported all the stuff from my uh, a previous sounder on my card. So I've got tracks for that are over 10 years old on my sounder, and then I always follow those. And then I found recently, like just on my last trip out, like the sandbars have moved completely. Um, so if I, if I, if I, oh, thanks, Brass. Uh, yeah, so if I followed my tracks now, like I'd literally be driving over the sandbars at high tide. Yeah. Um, yeah, th- that one does move a bit too. You know, yeah. You've got to be careful of that. And it's not the only one. There's plenty of them that do it. Yeah, but, but that's the ones I've noticed the most. There's two sand, like it's what we'll refer to locally as the, the crossover mm. um, in the Carrington, yeah. Yeah, and the, even the mouths of the channels and things like that, you know, yeah. they can move a bit. And, and, um, and if you misjudge those at the wrong time, you can be spending a night out there. And yeah, well, you don't want to do that. Let, let's talk about that because it happens all the time. Mm-hmm. I'd say, especially when there's a lot of people here, Every day, someone will be stuck on the mud somewhere. Yeah, depending on the tide, yeah, yeah. pretty much. As long as there's a low tide, yeah, yeah. someone's tried to cut a corner or, yeah. or, or something, uh, yeah, they'll end up getting stuck on the mud. And a lot of times you'll see, we'll be down at the club at 11 o'clock at night, and you'll see lights coming back up the river, and they'll, <laughs> they'll pull into the bar and be like, oh, we got stuck. <laughs> yeah. It does happen. So, so you have to... that, that is something you should prepare for as well, because if, especially if you don't know the area um, and, you, and you're brand new to it, always have yourself a sandbar kit. Yeah, I think one of the Michelle's here, I think she's got like a bottle of scotch and, and some other stuff on board, but yeah, that's, a, that's her sandbar kit. Yeah, make sure you, yeah, <laughs> make, maybe a blanket, yeah. some spare food, some water. <laughs> a lot of Aragard. Yeah, yeah, Aragard or 
Aussie coils or yeah. Thermocell or something, um, because you know, the, obviously, the, you know, I mean, I've been, I've done it before. I've been stuck um, um, a couple of times, and you know, the the more time you spend on the water here, the more likely you are to for it to have yeah, it happen. If to you. you if you don't get stuck, you're not doing it right. Yeah. Like, you know what I mean? No, you're not going hard enough. So, Although you do, you do want to, you can easily minimise your chances of it by certainly not trying to take shortcuts on a dropping tide. Yeah. That's probably my biggest one. Yeah. Like, a, yeah. If the tide's coming in, I'm happy to take a shortcut and get stuck because I know that within 20 minutes the water's going to be a bit high. I'll be able to start moving through. You know. Yeah, like that trip we did a while back there where we went um, those coastal creeks and when we went out it was really shallow going yeah. out and, and that's fine doing that because we know for a fact the tide's going to be coming in. Yeah. You know, it's a dead calm day. It's a big tide coming in that afternoon, so we know we're going to get get through there. Even if you get stuck, you're not going to yeah. be stuck for long. But if it was the reverse. If you're heading out there or heading back in and the tide's dropping and it's that shallow, you got to be really careful because if you come off the plane and you hit the bottom, that's it. You're, you're probably going to be stuck there all night or all day, whichever. Yeah. So, yeah, you got... Didn't uh, um, Dave, 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 didn't he get stuck two days in a row? Yeah, in two different yeah. <laughs> two different weeks. Uh, yeah, and, yeah, and so... his Mrs. Big Red, she wasn't overly impressed. No, not, not at all. <laughs> uh, yeah, the, the old mud skipper. <laughs> so um, <laughs> two days consecutively. Uh, so, but no, and it, it happens. And it's, it's not hard to do it. You know, it's uh, it's quite easy to do it, especially if you're going into those creeks. You know, and generally speaking, they're the creeks that you want to be in because they're the ones that produce. Yeah. So yeah. So uh, you know, you you're going through those, and uh, you think it's right, but at, obviously some of the creeks here are very long as well. They're not just you know one or two k's, three k's. They they could be you know. 10, 15 kilometres long that you've got to get through. So, you know, you've got to, be, you've got, you've got to take all that into consideration when all that water drops out. Uh, you know, you're a long, long way from the ocean. Yeah. And then the channels at the mouths of those creeks as well. Um, you know, those channels can go out for miles, especially you go like the mouth of the MacArthur or the mouth of the Crooked. Yeah. Those channels are literally several kilometres long. Um, and, and they've got a few dog legs in them, you know, so. Yeah, and I you think miss they, them. Oh, you can't trust your sounder on them either. Mm -hmm. So that they are sort of marked on your sounder, as as, as where the channels are, but they're not. But they're, they're, not, they're accurate. not accurate. No, no. no. Um, best best to either go out there and just take it easy and and find find where the channel is, or uh, follow someone out. Yeah, well, that's what I was going to just about to say is that um, a couple of pieces of advice that I give to guys, especially come and stay with us at the lodge or you know run into at the bar and it's their first trip. I say, right, when you put your boat in at the boat ramp in the morning, um, especially during the season, there's, there's almost always going to be somebody else there. Just have a chat to them and say, hey, mate, I've never been out before. Do you mind if I follow you down the river for a bit and uh, learn my way? So you can do that and find your way through the rock bar just here at King Ash Bay and, um, and the Carrington, if that's the way you're going. Um, and they can, you know, people are gen generally speaking pretty bloody helpful here. So... Um, yeah. people happens you, all the time yeah people yeah. let you tag on and or the other thing is as well is if you want to go outside around the islands and things like that and you're not really sure the piece of advice I give is go out at the very bottom of the tide because that way you cannot get stuck if you get stuck at the bottom of the tide you, you, you're very short time before you can get going again yeah um, and then you can put a track in which is uh, you know or put drop some waypoints in there um, so you know how it is on your sounder what it looks like and you can do it very accurately at the low tide because at the low tide the, the uh, channels out the, at the mouths are the only things that have water in them yeah. all those sandbars yeah. and sand flats mud flats they're all out of water completely so you can um, you can go out there at the very bottom of the tide and, and map those yourself so so yeah so um, in terms of time of year to come here I mean this time of year now we're at the uh, the very end of the year nearly Christmas um, uh, you know it's, it's well, like I said earlier we, we are still open the club's still open um, uh, we've still got customers coming into the lodge um, you know still uh, mostly station guys and things like that that finished up uh, mustering and stuff for the year the barra fishing is pretty good at the moment uh, we are getting a fair bit of rain you know the wet season's kicked in and um, everything's starting to green up really quickly now yeah. uh, it was it wasn't that long ago everything was just dust and now it's uh, it's all nice and green again yeah well that's the the cycle throughout the year at king ash bay people complaining about the dust and yeah. then you complain about the mud <laughs> and then you complain about the dust and that's the yearly cycle <laughs> every year <laughs> yeah complain about the uh, the heat and the dryness of everything and then complain about the rain your mrs katie we had our first rain of the year and she went out there she's like oh i hate rain <laughs> <laughs>
<laughs> we just laughed. First train of the year. First train. Uh, no, no, we love the right here. We, we do, definitely sorry. need it to, uh, to keep things going. So so you can come this time of year. It's pretty good. Like, I love this time of year. Yeah. And, um, if you ask any local, they'll say it's their favourite time of year. Like, yeah. any time in the wet season. Because it, it's the time of year where we really, you know, uh, get back to our territory roots. We Absolutely. sort of uh, just slow right down. And, uh, you know, everyone's, you know, I mean, it's that festive season anyway. So people are, generally speaking, a bit happy. Yeah. Um, you know, people are planning trips away or people have got family coming to visit them here and things like that. You know, um, everything quietens down, so it's a lot slower paced. Uh, you don't have, you know, a million people travelling around, so it is a great time of year, especially if you like doing things by yourself. It's a great time of year to be here. Yes. Um, although, having said that, if you are here this time of year, you've got to take into account that there's um, bugger all people on the water. You know, there's only a few boats um, at the moment a day going out sort of thing. So, you know, it might be only a dozen or something at the moment. Yeah. A day, there might only be a couple of houseboats left in the river. Yeah, so, so you go fishing all day and not see another boat. Yeah, so you've just got to take that in, into account and make sure you've got, you know, we mentioned it before, make sure you've got your EPIRB and, and, and test it, check it, make sure it's working, make sure your radio is working. Don't rely solely on your radio, as we found out the other day. You know, when, it's, when we are getting rain here in overcast days, uh, the radios don't work that well on the repeater channel because although the fishing club's got its own repeater channel, we've got our own actual repeater tower out on Van Lanol. Channel 81. Uh, channel 81. Um, obviously, it is solar powered. So when we get days of rain and cloud cover, the batteries don't get charged up. Therefore, the repeater doesn't work. Therefore, you can't get people on the repeater. And because 99.99% of people run channel 81 on their radio, you can revert back to channel 16 unless somebody's got two radios or um, dual watch or something like that um, on their radio. They won't hear you on channel 16. And again, there's bugger all people around as well. So, you know, actually cool thing, new iPhone, mate. I just found out the other day, iPhone, even out of range, you can send emergency messages. Yeah, right, yeah. Yeah, new iPhone uh, feature. Yeah, so uh, if it picks up a satellite, it'll give you a little notification in the corner and it'll say, yeah. How does it, how's it know it's an emergency? Well, I, was, well, I mean, I think it's, uh, I don't think you can message your mate. You've got, <laughs> you, 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 you can only message uh, like the emergency services. Okay, like, so, right, yeah. so uh, yeah, you, you hit um, the panic, panic button on the phone and... Um, and uh, yeah, and it'll get you through. That's to, a pretty um, cool feature. Yeah, so and it'll, it'll basically. Um, well, I actually, because I, I saw the the feature on there, and then I wanted to know about it, so I actually went and watched a um, a YouTube video about it, and then it was yeah, pretty much explained it that um, it'll give the appropriate people your um, coordinates, and you can give them a message yeah. and say you know whether you're injured or whatever. So you know that's a, that's a cool feature if you've got a new iPhone, but. You know, um, you know, a lot of people got sat phones and things like that yeah. as well, which are very helpful. We just need Elon to bring out a phone that connects to the Starlink <laughs> network. That'd be that'd be so good. Well, we'll see what happens, mate. I mean, yeah, well, I don't think it'll be too far away. Yeah. I mean, look, you look a few years ago, we had almost no internet here at all. Yeah. If you wanted to download a movie years ago, you had to drive to Down. <laughs> it was, it, it'd be easier to go find a blockbuster movie and rent it than it would be to watch it on Netflix uh, through the, the uh, Flame and Telstra network, yeah. uh, which was horrendous, still is. Um, but um, now with, uh, you know, over the, only the last 18 months or so, Starlink has oh. just absolutely been a game changer, even yeah. out on the boat. Uh, you know, kicking back, watching the uh, the cricket World Cup yeah, and uh, so the footy, and <laughs> yeah, and so yeah, and heaps of people have it. Like you see through the caravan park, like every or every fifth camp has it. <laughs> I reckon. Yeah, highly recommend yeah, Starling. Very popular. Um, and you know, it's yeah, it's worth every cent. I mean, we've had previous to that, we had um, Activate. Yeah. And, um, oh yeah, yeah. Skymaster, which is the Skymaster satellite. Yeah. Skymaster satellite yeah. yeah, but I mean that is. It's about a bit less than one tenth of the speed. Oh yeah. So yeah. It, it was it was brilliant for what it was at the time. And nearly the same price. Yeah. Yeah. Well, it was good. It was good when yeah. it first you know when I first got uh, Skymaster, I was pretty over the moon, mate. I was super yeah. excited. Yeah, because you went from nothing to something. Yeah. Yeah. So yeah, you could you could stream a very low quality movie on Netflix. Some very slowly <laughs> with some buffering in between yeah. Uh, but yeah, now with Starlink mate, you can just do everything you can download movies in seconds yeah so we got on to this topic because we're talking about your your phone and emergency if, you, if you're stuck somewhere yeah um, just what, another thing I want to mention about being stuck if you're out on the flats um, sort of the the local 
rule that people talk that people talk about is uh, we won't come looking for you until the next day. Yeah, and um, unless unless somebody's seen flares going yeah. up, or you know we've got notification that an ether has been um, uh, activated or something like that, no one's going to go looking for you till the next day, especially if. One, we don't know who you are, we don't know where you've gone. There's there's absolutely no point at all in us going out in the middle of the night looking for somebody if we don't know who they are, where they are, what sort of boat they're in, yeah. anything like that. So, so there's a 99% chance you're stuck on the mud and need yeah. to wait for water. Yeah, well, the, the first thing I do, and, it, and it's happened on several occasions now where um, um, somebody comes to the bar usually at yeah. night time, they say, oh, the guys that are camped next to me, uh, they haven't come back yet. Yeah. And so the first things that I ask are, um, yeah, how many people are there? Oh, um, husband and wife, how old are they? Uh, do you know their names? Do you know them well? No, I don't know them. Um, so I basically try and gather all the information that I can, what sort of boat they're in, where they've likely to, to uh, have gone, um, all of that sort of information. I compile all that together just in case, um, you know, something, you know, they don't come, don't turn up. Yep. Um, and that way we can get straight onto the police and, uh, and let them know. And then one of the other things I do is, is I look at the tide chart straight away and go, okay, well, we've just had a really, really low tide at yep. seven o'clock tonight and now it's nine o'clock. So let's uh, let's see around one o'clock in the morning, see if they're home. Because <laughs> uh, I'd, I'd say that's probably what's happened, mate. They're stuck in a sandbar, but even if they even if they don't make it back, It'll be, um, we'll have everything organised so um, we can get on to um, the, uh, the uh, police and emergency services uh, first thing the next morning. And at first light, we'll go out and have a look and try and find them. So that's actually raised a really good point. If you are here or, or anywhere for that matter, make sure you tell people um, where you're going and do not change from that. So if you're saying you're going to one location, don't go there and then go, oh, there's nothing, no fish here, I'm going to go somewhere completely different. Because if something happens, people will be looking in completely the wrong area. Yeah. And I, I can tell you now from spending time in, um, you know, helicopters and aircraft and stuff here, even, even from the sky, it is it is such a big country. Even some of the drone shots, I mean, you can probably throw some drone shots up at some of the creeks and stuff. Yeah. It is almost impossible to spot a boat, you know, um, you know, from the air. So if, if, you, if you're somewhere where you're not supposed to be or where you said, you, you know, if you're not where you said you were, then it makes it all that much harder. So make sure you tell somebody exactly where yeah. you're going. Something they used to do it, um, when it was open to the public, Lorella Springs, they used to, when someone would go, out on the property, it's a million acres. Um, they would literally sign them out and say, "All right, well, where 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 do you want to go today? You, oh, you want to go swimming? All right, how about this place here? All yep. right, we'll send you out to Blue Waterhole or something." Yeah. And they'll literally write the how many people going, what time they left, what time they expected home. Yeah, and then you know? you'd check in when you yeah, got back. Yeah, when you got back. Yeah. So. Yeah. So I think, um, um, you know, for, for us, obviously, we're a bit, we got a few too many people to be here. Yeah, yeah, you need a big uh, <laughs> the, the girl's the opposite of me. <laughs> we flat out. <laughs> and we'd be looking for people who actually uh, forgot to check back in and then left or something yeah. like that. So, but um, if I go out by myself, I'll always, literally always message you. Yeah. And just say, I'll just yeah. let you know, um, yeah, I'll be, I'll be back around three. So mm -hmm. if I'm not back by five, send help. <laughs> yeah. If I ever go miss him, just ask young boy, he knows everything. Yeah, yeah, yeah. He knows exactly where I'll be. Oh, yeah. <laughs> so, yeah, but that is a good point around make sure people know where you're going and yeah. um, and what your plans are. So, um, and make sure you've got plenty of, plenty of gear and that to, to survive overnight if you need to and, yeah. you know, blankets. Because um, back to the weather, it... People may not believe it, but it gets extremely cold here at night time. Uh, yep. You know, that, that, that bloody Jesus. Sorry, mate. Very unprofessional. Very unprofessional. That's my, um, my alarm going off for some reason. Excellent. <laughs> Yeah, so um, just on that, but you know, going back to the, the weather, people will um, won't be aware that, uh, or may not be aware that it gets cold here, or may not believe that it gets cold here, but it gets extremely cold here. So at the peak of the dry season, like we can have the nights can get down to, um, you know, seven eight degrees um, without wind chill, and then you add a little bit of dew or fog with that, and uh, and ten knots, fifteen knots of uh, southeasterly. And it is freezing. So, yeah. I mean, just this year, in the middle of the year, in the middle of the day, we had ladies sitting at the bar with a little gas, portable gas heater. That's right. In the middle, middle of the day at lunchtime. 
<laughs> so it does get very cold here. So, you know. And everyone was jealous of them. <laughs> you and me included. <laughs> Actually, I think we talked about roll on at one stage <laughs> for, their, for their heater because it was freezing. Yeah. It was absolutely freezing. So. And people, people from down south might be saying, oh, that's not cold. Mm. But it, it also depends on what you're used to. Yeah. Like for us, we're very much acclimatised to the weather here and, and how hot it gets. So if, as soon as it drops, in, once you get down to those single digits, it's it's proper cold for us. Yeah. Yeah, it gets, uh, it gets very cold. Just make sure I turn my alarm back off, mate. <laughs> so I don't like going off again. Excellent. Yeah, so, um, yeah, and other, other things to um, consider when you're here is um, we spoke a little bit about uh, maybe an episode or two back about some things that, you know, you should or shouldn't do. Like uh, we spoke about people, you know, not waving when you're driving down the river and yeah, they're not waving a back bit of to you. etiquette on the water. Um, you know, not holding the bow ramp, not taking up the middle of the bow ramp or, or loading and unloading your boat at the ramp, you yeah. know, whilst there's 10 cars waiting to get in and out. Yeah. Um, and just, just slowing down and being courteous to other people. But, you know... Um, other things like you know you might you might follow somebody out fishing or something like that, but you know if somebody takes you down and shows you down the river and whatever, there's no need to go and pull up right next to them when they drop anchor and go fishing yeah. right yeah. on top of them. So uh, if you're in within a uh, uh, snapper let's distance, maybe <laughs> look out. Something <laughs> might get a bit, might get a bit upset. Yeah. And uh, you know things like you know you might be on a trolling run like this time of year. People like to troll for big bar. I think yeah. we're going to go and give that a go. Um, before you take off and yep. you know uh, you, there might be a troll and run that you, you usually do and somebody else might be doing it don't just jump in there and cut in front of somebody or or anything you know give them plenty of plenty of space cut in behind them not in front and uh, and if somebody hooks up to a fish you know give them plenty of room don't let him run over their lines and stuff and I've seen it before yep. you know people trolling and trolling past somebody uh, somebody else and you know somebody's got their shit so they've throw and cast a line over their, their lines that they're trolling and went around their lure in and cut it off and, you know, throw it in the drink and things like that. Like, there's just no need for that sort of... Well, we don't know. do that sort of thing here. No, like, absolutely no need not. for it. And, uh, yeah, I mean, it's it's definitely not within um, within the spirit of, of the place that we, you know, that we've got here. So, yeah. you know, that's that's definitely not the sort of people we want around the place. So, so you know, at the end of the day, you're here on holidays, you know, or you're, or you're retired, so you don't need to... You know, you don't need to carry on silly like that and just enjoy yourself and, you know, uh, you know, anyway, start getting your mates together. Yeah. And and plan a trip. Yeah. If you haven't been here before, get get all. Well, this is the time of year, so we've got, this is the, the festive season, so where you, you're having barbecues and catching up with family and friends and stuff mm. like that. So this is the perfect time to get together and work out who's serious about, about coming up here, whether you're mm. from Queensland or from South Australia. Or New South Wales. <laughs> then, or yeah. Tasmania. Yeah. Or West Australia. I don't know we left anyone out, did we? Yeah, oh, ACT. Uh, yeah, yeah, ACT, yeah. <laughs> so, uh, yeah, start planning your trip because, yeah, it's going to take a while to, to, while, while, a while to plan this because uh, you're going to have to make sure your boat's all all good, all, all squared away, your trailer, the bearings, the, mm. you know. Uh, yeah. You're going to have to book in advance if you want to to stay uh, in any of the private businesses here. Yeah, well, that's it. You've got the lodge um, out of business or, or the cabins or the houseboats. And, I mean, I know for next year, 2024, um, like, we are jam-packed yeah. for a lot of the season. I so we've got, busy, yeah. we've got some availability. Brett out at North Island, I know he's, he's you know, he's really busy. Um, the houseboats, they're really busy. Yeah. So, you know, if you start planning a trip now, you might still be able to get some... How many years, in it, if you wanted to come here for Easter and stay in the Kiash Bay Lodge, how many years would you have to book ahead? Oh, several. Yeah. <laughs> yeah, no, uh, Katie's got that booked out yeah. pretty well, solid, mate. And same as, you know, October, November, um, they're pretty much booked out by the same groups uh, every year. And they, yeah. and, they, and they book sort of two to three years in advance. Yeah, every, wow. every every trip they, they come, they look at the tide charts for... Uh, the following couple of years and and uh, yeah make their bookings yeah. so so if you want to get in and into any of those places uh, especially that time of year when it's hot and you want some air con you don't yeah, want well, to flip the swag think, but there'll still be plenty of room if you want to come up and stay in a swag or mm. or your, your caravan or camper trailer or whatever there's, there'll there's be, there'll always be... room for powered and unpowered sites here. yeah we'll always fit you in yeah yeah absolutely yeah. unless there's something absolutely crazy happens but yeah. but uh, more or less we've always got plenty we, we don't actually have individual sites i suppose which we did haven't mentioned before no and then then we, we don't take bookings no as, that's a, right. as a fishing club yeah the caravan park doesn't take mm. bookings so yeah no allocated sites no bookings 
um, yeah, pick a site wherever you or pick a spot wherever you want, pretty much. Yeah, yeah, within reason. So yeah. we've got obviously powered and unpowered areas, and yeah, you can pick anywhere within those areas and and stay there. So um, so you don't need to book in advance for that. But um, but if you're planning a trip, obviously you need to start planning. Start planning the um, what. Um, what uh, route you're going to take to get here so yeah. uh, you know if you come from um, Victoria um, you know no doubt you'll come through South Australia um, up uh, through the centre up to um, Daly Waters Highway in yeah and then turn off there and, and come in on that that road where if, where if you're from New South Wales uh, Queensland you're most likely going to go up through depending on whereabouts in Queensland you're from or New South Wales, you, but you more or less, you know, come up through sort of Longreach to um, Mount Isa. Yeah, Mount Isa. Cloncurry, yeah. Mount Isa. Yeah. Um, unless you're from right at the top, obviously, then you come across. And then you'll sneak up the uh, the, the cattle road, what do they call it? The, the Tablelands Highway. Tablelands Highway, yeah, yeah. yeah. Which is yeah. a bit of a rough rough road yeah. still. It's, it's, it's all, it is all bitumen. The, only the last 22 k's uh, is dirt. Yeah. Um, the rest of it's all bitumen, but, um, but it is single lane in some places. But we've got the... What did you say, mate? The uh, best road in Australia coming from Daly Waters. Oh, yeah. There. If you're coming from the Daly Waters direction, yeah. The first, I don't know what it is, 50 k's or something. Mm. Yeah, it's, yeah, best road in Australia at the moment. It's all, uh, yeah, shout out to exact, con- uh, exact uh, contractors, <laughs> mate. They're uh, doing a great job out there. I think they're, they're bringing that all the way, like, a few hundred k's at Someone least. Someone said up to the jump up, I heard. Yeah, yeah. So the jump up for people who which don't is, know. Which is, is not far from Cape Crawford. Like, yeah, about 60 k's yeah. from Cape Crawford. Yeah. yeah. So that, that'll may mean it's about 250-odd k's of new dual lane road, which yeah. would be really good. It'll take them a couple of years to finish all that, though. I'd imagine so, yeah. mate. Although they're smashing it out. They they got, are, they've so. got some big gear in there doing yeah. it so, um, and doing a great job of it, too. So Although, at the moment, it's a bit wet, wet yeah, out there. Yeah, I don't there know if they can be much work be, going on now. <laughs> I, don't think, I don't think they'll be uh, driving machines around out there at yeah. the moment. But, um, but, yeah, so if you plan your trip up, also you can consider things, what's going on here at the club. Um, yeah, East, let's talk Easter. Easter weekend. It's our biggest weekend of the year. Yeah, big, it's a big fishing comp, the Easter Fishing Classic. Yep. I reckon uh, it's been on since the 1980s. Yeah, I reckon. I reckon I've seen an old poster floating around somewhere in 1987 or something like that. Yeah. The Barra Classic, they called it back then. Yep. Um, yeah, now it's the uh, King Ash Bay Easter Fishing Classic. Yep. Yeah. And, there's, we're, and on that in that fishing comp, we've got reef species, estuary species, um, yeah, we've got champion anglers, yeah. um, uh, uh, kids. We've got all sorts of stuff. Uh, this year, I think we had roughly about eighty odd thousand dollars worth of cash and prizes. Yeah. So we we all well, uh, we um, raffled a, a, a tinny. Yeah. So like a, a four, three, five or something like that. The yeah. tinny. Um, you know, brand new tinny with a um, yeah. Yamaha. Yeah, huge Apple. prizes. As long as weather permitting, like it's, it's, it is at Easter, it, like an Easter changes, and I think it is a fairly early Easter next year. <laughs> Relatively early, yeah. 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 So it's still going to be hot. There's still going to be the chance of storms and things like that. But that's that's the exciting times when yeah. when when the barra are on. Yeah, you know, when when the fishing's really good. We have uh, live music. Yeah, yeah. Do we have the, the same band booked? Yes, I believe so. The yeah. Little Ripper Band. They're almost part of the furniture here yeah. at Kiash Bay. They yeah. come every year. They have done for a lot since. Well, as long as I can remember. Yeah. Um, yeah, they, they come up. I don't even know where they're from. I've known them for 10 years, and I don't uh, even know where they're maybe from. Maybe around, like, Nambucca Heads or something like that? Yeah, New South, South Wales, Wales. Okay, yeah. yeah. So they drive all the way up. They come up here. They'll spend a couple of weeks here, play every other night, including the whole weekend of the fishing comp. Yeah. And, uh, yeah. It's do a, a great job. It's always such a good weekend, yeah. And, and right, right up our alley to our sort of music, like, um, you know, sort of, um, you know, 60s, 70s, 80s, 90s sort of, yeah. Um, you know, country, rock, blues, yeah. that sort of stuff. Yeah, they uh, cater to the audience here very well, yeah. Yeah, yeah, was all sorts of stuff. and, they, and A lot of Australian music as yeah, well. Yeah, a lot of Australian music, yeah, and they're very, very, very talented guys, so um, yeah. we love having them here. But, yeah, that's a great weekend, and I think this year we had around about 300, um, yeah. 300 participants in the comp. Yeah, okay. All up. Um, so, uh, you know, it's a, it is a great, great turnout. Um, big, big nights, very big nights. A lot of work to organise it. You oh know. yeah, um, and all volunteers too. Yeah, yeah, well, yeah, well, apart from the you know the bar stuff, oh, yeah, stuff the actual organisation of it. But, yeah. but to, to organise it all is is pretty much all voluntary, and um, you know it is. I reckon it's one of the one of the biggest ones going around. You know that that doesn't have major corporate yeah. sort of sponsors. Yeah, I, mean, I agree. Um, we we've got a lot of really really great sponsors, but then you know 
predominantly sort of territory businesses, privately, you know, family owned and operated businesses yeah. and things like that. And so, um, you know, tackle stores from Catherine and Darwin and and oh, all sorts of, you know, not just fishing shops, all sorts of uh, people donate all sorts of things from uh, from cash to prizes and, and uh, all sorts of things in between, so. Yeah, we'll go through, so I'll, I'll just put you on the spot with a bit of a controversial sort of topic. Um, with the Easter comp, so for a lot of years, well, it was always a what you'd call a kill cop or a weigh-in cop. Yep. So you, you bring your fish in and you weigh it in, and then a few years or maybe a quite a, maybe five years back or something like that, people started to think that maybe that's not a good idea, um, and they, we started doing photo comps and and stuff like that. Mm -hmm. um, but I personally, I, lo I love the weigh-ins. I love coming yeah. in and sitting there and watching the, the fish being weighed in. Yeah. And for the sake of two days a year, and it's these. these well, I'm, gonna, I'm giving you my opinion. I wanted to ask you your opinion. <laughs> yeah. I love the I, I love the uh, weigh-in comps. Yeah. What's your thoughts? Yeah. Well, I'm I'm very much the same, mate. Um, and it's and we have tried different ways of running the comp where it was um, a catch and release comp. Um, so where basically people would take photos with a, a card with a code on it that was given to them um, prior to the event starting on the Saturday morning or the Friday evening um, and they'd have to take a photo of a fish on a brag mat with that card in there to, to prove that it was caught on that at that time by that person and they're showing the length of it. The problem with it is, um, you know, with, with that sort of way of doing it is largely a technology issue um, here, even even with um, uh, Starlink internet and stuff like that. It is very difficult to get all that data. Like I just mentioned, we had, you know, about 300 people, just over 300 people into that comp. You know, we had, I think, 16 odd species of fish or something like that in it. You know, uh, 300 people by, um, you know, obviously not everyone caught every fi every yeah. species of fish, but you just think all of those photos that are coming in and they're coming in via email, um, via Facebook Messenger to our um, um, Facebook page and to our um, comp phone number. Yeah. So, and then people are concerned that because they haven't got a response straight away that they've received it. So then they send it as an email, a text message and on Facebook. And then people send it several times. Some will send it several times because it's not dropping in and out and things like that. Yeah. All of a sudden we have several thousand images that we have to download, um, go through them all, work out who they are, find out obviously then work out who all the winners are and then put that all onto our uh, onto our sheets and we have to do that all within a couple of hours because yeah. obviously we have to do it from the end of fishing um, on Sunday afternoon uh, five o'clock and then presentations we try and you know be out down there by sort of eight o'clock at the latest the last few years we haven't got down there until like well after nine I don't think yeah well this year you were up here doing um like doing the the weigh-ins effectively up here like taking all the data and uh you had me and katie down there doing lucky nomination prizes and and all sorts of stuff yeah. just, to, just to try and th keep things all the stuff that i was supposed to be yeah, down there doing you're lucky you guys were there doing yeah, that because everything ticking along yeah because and that, that that is one of the problems um you know but some people don't like the idea of the weigh-in comp because they think that too many fish get taken um whereas i mean as we've mentioned several times, you go down the car park any day, um, you know, during the season, and there's a hundred plus vehicles down there, yeah. and that's seven days a week. Yeah, this is one fishing comp competition once a year, and also um, being Easter weekend, and and um, there's not a lot of tourists here yet. It's it's predominantly people from town, so Aboriginal people and stuff, traditional owners and stuff that come out with their kids in it and get involved in it. And, you know, these guys, they want to spend their money and go out and go fishing with their family and, and their country and whatever. They want to take a feed home as they well. They do. Even, so, even if the, the technology side, a lot of them do struggle with the technology. So even uh, like the rules and things to do with the, taking a photo on the brag mat and that, some, I know some of the entries he got were like, people holding the fish and things like that, you know? Yes, like it's very difficult to work out who, who the winners simple, are like just that. Just bring your fish in and weigh um, them in. And I, I'm certain that, that virtually none of them go to waste. Some people yeah. talk about, the, um, yeah, don't, like don't put queenies in there because people don't want to keep queenies. Yeah, well, years ago, that and that was an issue years ago, but that's been dealt with. So there, there was an issue years ago when like the, the competition used to be the champion angler was the biggest aggregate, um, the, the heaviest aggregate weight of the biggest barramundi, queenfish and mangrove jack so all of a sudden you've got everybody's out there targeting queenfish yeah and then 
like they're not the best eating fish. You can make um, numus uh, yeah. and um, ceviche and, and, smokes too, and, and great smoked yeah. as well. I know you don't mind doing them on the charcoal, yeah, yeah. Um, and they're good like that. But a lot of people don't don't like them as well. So there was an issue with people just uh, you know they weigh them in, then they take another dump and throw them out, which obviously we don't want to see that happen. So um, so we removed that that fish from the from the weigh-in, you know, yeah. so we don't have that now. Well, even one year you did it, you, you set up massive eskies there. We're full of ice. And yeah. you said, if anyone doesn't want to keep their fish, put them in the eskies, and I'm, I'm sure that... And we were going to donate them to uh, there to Borrell or to... Um, not, we don't have food back there, but we had we had it organised there with um, some of the Aboriginal people in town that we're going to, going to take any leftover fish into town yeah. and uh, give it to some of the older people and stuff in Borrell. Yeah, okay. And turned out we didn't have any, you know... Not, not a nothing. single person put so, a fish in there. So, um, yeah, so, you know, it turns out that that wasn't really an issue either. So... Um, and this year we had, yeah, it, uh, after this year, working so hard trying to get it all perfect, um, it just, yeah, it just didn't work great. So we're going to go back to our, um, our weigh-in comps. Um, it'll be restricted, obviously. Yeah. So we're, we don't, we're not going to have things like queen fish in there to be, to be, you know, brought in just for the sake of being weighed in and thrown out. Yeah. But it'll be all, all good fish that people want to take home and eat. Yeah. Um, we'll have size limits on things like. Um, Barramundi, for example, we'll have a maximum size limit. Yeah. So if you catch a metery, you know we don't we don't want you to bring in uh, a meter twenty bar and weigh it in because it's not that great eating anyway. Yeah. So there, there'll be a size limit on that. I'm not sure exactly what it's going to be, and I think it'll be eighty centimeters. Eighty. Okay. Yeah. I think it'll be. So you're just looking for the 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 fattest, the fattest seventy nine you can. Yeah. yeah. Pretty pretty much. <laughs> so. so uh, Oh, that's, that's excellent. A, that's a uh, great you, time. You put this to the members as well. Why like you both had a special meeting? What was it called? A members forum. Yeah, that. yeah. So we held a members forum, and um, and I brought this up about the uh, fishing comp and asked for people to comment on it, and and no one had any comments on it really. Um, yeah. Other than um, you know, at a committee level, we had some comments about it, and we discussed it, and um, yeah, everyone I think was reasonably happy that you know we've satisfied. Um, that we've, you know, uh, that people are satisfied that we've, we we have tried other other methods, and uh, you know, comments have been made in the past that oh, we're the only place that ever has a kill comp, which is Not rubbish. True. You know, I mean, they, they do one in Down, uh, they want to do several in Down. Um, actually, I was down south on the east coast. There um, might have been Port Stevens or somewhere. Oh, is it Port Stevens? Yeah. Is it Port Stevens on the east coast? Yeah, on in New South Wales. Yeah, yeah, yeah. they had a. Um, yeah, they had a, um, a fishing comp when I was there and they were bringing in um, sharks and stuff. And they had, you know, people weighing in sharks and stuff. And I'm like, well, you know, we're definitely not doing that. <laughs> like, you know, so uh, no one's bringing in dugongs to weigh in or <laughs> sea turtles yeah. or anything like that. So, so you know, it's um, it's all fish that people want to keep. So we can put sharks on the list for the next podcast. We should talk about them because, like... Oh, yeah. They, they are, I reckon there's miles of them out there. Like, oh, there, there are. There so are many, many of them different. are protected and all that, but mm. anyway, we'll move on. So yeah, so the fishing comp's a great time of year. If you if you want to come up and, and get involved in that, you, you can obviously Easter weekend. But then there are other times throughout the year. So at least once a month we have a um, a comp. So we run our monthly comps, which are obviously nowhere near as big. So we don't have as much um, prizes in there. Yeah, like the but, prize for the biggest barrow might be five hundred dollars cash or something like that. Yeah, depending on how many people we get in there, we usually get up around about a hundred people for those monthly comps. Yes. Yeah. Um, so um, yeah, you can win. Yeah, you know, maybe upwards of five hundred bucks for the biggest, and then maybe three hundred bucks for the second biggest, and yeah. two hundred bucks for a mystery size or something we might throw in there. And those comps will we generally where they're just photo comps. Those ones because they're a lot easier to do as photo comps. Yeah. But yeah, and, that, and that's another thing too with the weigh-in comp. Like I remember as a kid being here, the best part about the whole weekend for me uh, was sitting there. You know, at the at the club and watching everyone line up with their fish and watching everyone bring their fish out yeah. and weigh them in, watching those big goldies come in and yeah. you know, big nanny guys and red ampers and trouts and you know talking to people, it, it just is a lot more atmosphere. Whereas if everyone's just sending photos in, you know, even if we you know we've tried having a uh, monitor there with the you know photos playing or people's photos playing, but it's not the same. No, it's not just close. you know the atmosphere there of seeing people. Uh, lining up with their fish and, and bringing them in, weighing them in is, um, you know, one of my favourite things, you know, favourite memories as a kid coming yeah. out here. So, and there um, will be some people listening to this that will 100% disagree with us. Which is and, fine. And the beat, yeah, it's just... D- just is what it is. Yeah, that's it. And you know, like, like, like I said at our uh, King S Ray Fishing Club AGM, maybe somebody else, if somebody wants to run it, they can they can <laughs> run it, run it how they want. But you know, we've certainly uh, certainly done it, um, you know, several different ways and gone through, you know, 
brainstorm many different options and yeah. um and you know we're, we're doing it that way this year anyway and we'll we'll see see what happens mate but obviously we're open to suggestions and yeah. you know there may be other ideas that we haven't thought of that yeah. people may have that we can we can look into i mean we're not certainly not um not going to listen to other people's thoughts and ideas on things but um any positive criticism is fine but um, that, that's why it's going to be this year anyway. Uh, okay. Sorry, uh, Easter weekend. Yeah. But, you know, other than that, like there's, you know, 1st of July, mate, one of my favourite days after the Easter weekend. I think it's probably my, my um, yeah. you know, favourite weekend. It would be like the second biggest weekend of the year. Yeah. 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 Well, not always, it's not always weekend, yeah. but it's always... Oh, yeah, but, uh, yeah. Um, 1st of July, Territory Day, yeah. self-government day. So for people that don't know, um, well, people that don't know call it Cracker Night um, because <laughs> that's one day a year we're allowed to have fireworks. And um, and we do. <laughs> we do so. <laughs> um, so yeah, the club puts on a, a great show. Um, uh, we have uh, dress up bloody uh, you know things uh, like what do you call it like dress themes. Yeah. So this year, well, we have this year. Greece was a theme this yeah, year. It was yeah, like a. 50s or whatever, yeah. Yeah, Greece 50s, 50s theme, 60s, yeah. I don't know. 60s, I can't remember, it's somewhere um, around there. <laughs> but yeah, so we'll be, you know, everyone dresses up as, uh, you know, Greece themed people and, uh, you know, we put on, the club puts on a massive big fireworks show and, yeah. you know, there's heaps of entertainment. We get, again, we get a little rip band or, or a band in to, to perform over the night. And Yeah, even uh, the previous, last year, it was a Mexican theme and then even the kitchen did Mexican food. Yeah, that's it, yeah. Yeah, yeah well, actually, yeah, well, usually they had to try and do um, the themed yeah. food as well. So, like, the Grease theme was like a... They had to, and we usually set up like a photo booth. So That's this year right. was like a, a diner, like an old American style diner, yeah. um, where you could sit down and have your photos taken. And um, the food was like, yeah, like hamburgers and hot dogs and and things like that. So obviously we got, you know, they did about 400 meals that night. So they've got to keep it fairly, yeah, fairly, <laughs> fairly tame. Yeah, there's no filet mignons or anything yeah. like that. But see, that's the time of year when there's heaps of families here. Like talk, yeah. talk about Easter comp. Or maybe Easter's not about not the best example, but like around Easter time, when there's a lot of groups of fishermen, fishermen here, like they're groups of ten blokes. It's almost like a, a footy trip they come up yeah. for each year. But then uh, Territory Night, that's lots of families yeah, and yeah. stuff. There, there were, I reckon a, a few years back, um, on the, or the or two years back, when with the Mexican one, um, I reckon there must have been fifty kids mm. down there. Because I remember the uh, the piñata. Yeah, yeah. It was a whack and it. it had fishing lures in it with hooks and stuff. <laughs> <laughs> so all the kids racing to pick up the lures. There's no uh, harm oh, done. No harm done, luckily. Because they had. Did they have? Because I wasn't here. I was. Oh. I was in the state because I had, I had something oh, yeah, I, yeah. I had to go away for. But um, but then they they had two pinyas, one for kids and then one for adults. That was great. Yeah. And the kids weren't supposed to run in for the adults one because yeah. there was lures in there. But That's obviously right. kids being kids. Yeah. As soon as you got busted open, everyone's jumping <laughs> in. Time not the lures. Ah, oh, we're a fishing club. Yeah, yeah. bound to get a hook in them eventually <laughs> so uh, <laughs> but no that's a great that's one of the, one of the uh, great nights of the year mate yeah. that territory day and um, school holidays yeah so uh, there are a lot of families around yeah a lot of people um, come from Tennant Creek and Alice Springs, Alice Springs and, yeah. and Catherine yeah. for, for the school holidays yeah you get a lot of families come in a lot of, a lot of members mm. have kids that, that live in places like that yeah, no, it's a great time of year. So if you're planning on a trip, you can plan around those things. I know there are several people that plan around uh, Territory Day. Yeah. And, and actually, I know on the club um, Facebook page, we've been getting messages already. What's the theme? So I think the the girls are working on that, mate. I'm not going to... Yeah, yeah. <laughs> I'm not getting involved in, in that. Yeah, uh, that's just, yeah, cable, but... stay tuned to the King Ash Bay Fishing Club, Inc., yeah. Facebook page, yeah, and, it, and that every every event coming up, they, they always post about it. Yeah, yeah. So uh, we'll have something on there, and there'll be a, the theme will be posted on there, so um, people get the costumes because everyone does dress up. Um, you know, if you don't dress up with the uh, in, in in you know following the theme, you'll you'll stick out because pretty much not I'd say not at least ninety nine percent of people dress up. Actually, yeah, your mum bloody did a, a uh, got all the girls together and did a line dancing. Yeah. Uh, Demonstration made for the middle of the yeah, yeah <laughs> the which, 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 which went very well. The yeah. there, everyone was cheering. Oh, yeah, I might have good. some videos you can uh, drop in oh, there, mate, <laughs> to make my happy. Yeah, so everyone, so once um, people are planning a trip, you've decided when you want to come up, whether it's for a special event like that or or when not a lot is happening. Um, you, you're planning a trip. What what should people bring? Like we're, we're talking 
boats. Yeah, so I mean, obviously, um, yeah. You, if you come here, you want to bring a boat. You know, that's that's the that's the main yeah. reason people come here. Yeah. Um, predominantly um, is yeah, bring a boat. Um, you don't have to have a you know an eight meter bloody stabby craft to go out and, uh, and chase not, a yeah. barra. You know, uh, predominantly during the you know dry season that you get uh, nomads that have car top, you know, roof toppers and yeah. things. So. Like three seven five, yeah, three seven five, fifteen horsepower or something. Yeah, I, I wouldn't. Yeah, we call them little croc mickeys. Uh, <laughs> croc biscuits. Although um, Mike and I in a three seven five might not go real, real well. We need a fifty on the back still. But uh, but yeah, so make sure you yeah bring your obviously your boat and uh, and bring enough boats for people. Don't bring eight blokes and one tinny because I've, I've had guys do that before. They've come up with a big group of guys and only one boat and they get here and. Uh, you know they're sitting around for two days out of three because they're taking turns and who's oh. who's going in for a boat ride. So um, although you know we hire a boat out um, from the lodge there, Katie looks after that. So um, you know if uh, that's the punt, the, the punt, yeah. So um, such I love that boat. It's the the biggest small boat you'll ever go on. <laughs> yeah, no, it's a ripper. Um, it's perfect for around here in the shallow water. Two big buffaloes on the we can both stand on the side of it. <laughs> And it hardly even tips. Yeah, that's, no, it's that's a, very cool. She's a good tinny that one, but um, but yeah, but make sure yeah, obviously yeah, you bring that sort of sort of thing. Yeah, all your fishing gear. Uh, like we mentioned, I think maybe episode one, like the servo here has pretty much everything you could want, um, other than grog. Yeah, you cannot buy takeaway alcohol here. Um, so we, we don't have a takeaway license. There's a, a takeaway shop in um, Borrell, but you can only get like 18 cans um, after 2.30 in the afternoon. You've got to blow in the bag to get them. Like it's it's a it's a drama. So uh, make sure you bring any grog or anything you want, um, beer, wine, spirits, that sort of yeah. stuff. Make sure you bring it up with you. If we, you are a drinker, like like we are, you, you, you'll find you will drink a, a lot more here than you think you will yeah a hundred percent and i've made we've had the lodge for about eight years now i think and all all of the big groups that are coming here for the first time always run out of grog yeah so we do run a truck to darwin uh, once a week where you can get um you can buy beer from the bottle shop in down and get the truck to pick it up for you on the way down. Um, but, you know, again, that'll that'll cost you money. Um, you know, it'll be more expensive than if you come from, you know, Brisbane yeah. or Sydney or something like that. That's once a week, so you need to make sure you jag the right days because yeah. you might miss out on that run. You know? Yeah, if you miss it, then uh, then you've got to wait a whole other week. So, um, and that, that has happened to plenty of people before. So make sure you bring uh, ample grog. You better be looking at it than looking for it, mate. You know, you can always take it back home with you. Um, yeah. Uh, you know. Or, oh, you yeah. could always donate it to us. Yeah, yeah. If you got, yeah, if you drink <laughs> Captain Morgan's or any anything really, <laughs> we'll clip it up. Even the zeros at the moment. Yeah. yeah. So, uh, so yeah, make sure you bring, um, yeah, bring plenty of plenty of uh, grog and things like that. And any, obviously, any, um, um, you know, specific things that um, you know, anything you wouldn't find in a normal sort of supermarket. Uh, you know, chemist sort of things, you know, medication, stuff like that. There's no chemist in moral or there's, you know, there's nothing like that. So any of those uh, specialised type things, yeah. make sure you bring that with you. But otherwise, the servo here all the has, essentials has here. pretty much everything yeah. you need to, to get by. So, so actually, I was fish, fixing a, a couple of fishing rods today, Lane. I went, went over and uh, bought a couple of rod tips. They, they, they got a big tackle box there full of all, all rod guides and rod tips and all sorts of stuff and had the perfect size one, mate. Uh, it took uh, Joe and I a little while to go through and find the right ones, but had the perfect size, the exact ones. And I always uh, say that to people, that anything you need, mm. doesn't matter how obscure you think it is, mm. go and ask the girls in the servo. Yeah. Because... It, it, Tucked away in a cupboard somewhere, yeah. they'll probably have it. Yeah, it's, it's quite remarkable the amount of stuff they have. So I, reckon we, I reckon we shut it down, Bruss. You reckon? I reckon. Righto. Shut it down, Bruss. Shut it down. <laughs> oh, look at that. Oh, yeah. Guides in the Gulf.